Hey, so I thought I would make a bit of a complimentary video to my Measure for Measure vid, especially on the characters of the play that I skipped over. If you happen to be new here and you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm referring to the last video I posted on the links between Sims 2 Veronaville and Shakespeare's play Measure for Measure. It's advisable that you see that video before watching this one, otherwise you won't know what I'm talking about. It's a long video, but the link will be in the description if you're here for it. So as I said in that video, I did skip over some secondary characters to keep things somewhat tight and to the point, because there was so much to talk about already. Um, but some of these characters are still worth talking about, and they can be a source of inspiration for baby names for your Vernavel's next gen, if that's something you want. And I'm also taking the opportunity to go back to the previous two plays that I covered, so The Two Gentlemen of Verona and Twelfth Night, to excavate the secondary characters that I didn't mention there either. So that should give you a decent amount of names to work with in total. There will be a concise recap on screen at the end, there's a timestamp for it if you don't care about the details. So the first one is definitely Aeschylus. Aeschylus is a lord who works for the Duke. He's like Vincentio's closest employee, his right hand really. They have a relationship that's more like a friendship, but still with in mind the fact that Vincentio is the boss. When Vincentio transfers his powers to Angelo, Aeschylus becomes Angelo's assistant. He doesn't approve of Angelo's extremely tough on crime approach to Claudio's case, and he counsels Angelo against putting Claudio to death, but Angelo doesn't follow his advice, and Aeschylus ultimately submits to his authority. Even though he's not as harsh as Angelo, Aeschylus still disapproves of the very liberated sexual practices encouraged by people like Mistress Overdone in Pompeii. He takes part in Mistress Overdone's arrest and trip to prison. In the final scene, during the trial of Angelo's accusers, um, Aeschylus accuses Fry Lodovic of slandering the state, and he orders that he be sent to prison along with Isabella and Mariana. Fry Lodovic is revealed to be Duke Vincentio right after that, and in the end Aeschylus doesn't face any repercussions. His degree of responsibility in the whole debacle is in a grey area. You could say that he was just doing his job of protecting the Duke, or Deputy Duke in this case, against defamation. But in practice he was wrong in his judgement of Isabella and Mariana. He didn't believe them, he believed Angelo. And he was going to send Isabella and Mariana to prison on the basis of his wrong assumptions. That's not brought up at all in the end after the grand reveal. Aeschylus doesn't seem to be held accountable for anything. The name Aeschylus is also notable because it's the name of the Prince of Verona in Romeo and Juliet. In that play, he's a rather good, wise character. He disapproves of the feud between the Montagues and Capulets, and he wishes that they would just stop murdering one another. So we'll come back to that name, it's definitely one that would make sense to use in Veronaville. It could be especially relevant to use in the Summer Dream family, actually, since like Prince Aeschylus in Romeo and Juliet, the Summer Dreams are kind of outside of the feud, they are the conciliating family. The name Aeschylus suggests scales, like the weighing scales often associated with justice, and it also sounds very similar to Aeschylus, I think that's how you pronounce it, Aeschylus. I checked five times and I just can't... I don't know why it's so hard. It also sounds very similar to Aeschylus, the ancient Greek playwright who is often called the father of tragedy. So yeah, it's kind of a grand noble name. On the other end of the name grandiosity spectrum, there's a character in Measure for Measure who's called Abhorson, from the verb to abhor, which means to hate, and Horson, son of a whore. Um, Abhorson is the executioner. He's not really abhorrent, actually. We don't see much of him, but he seems like a well-adjusted guy, considering that he's an executioner, which, I mean, this kind of work has to be quite dramatic, I don't know. It probably does something to you, I would imagine. Uh, but he, he seems like a reasonable guy, and uh, he holds his job in pretty high regard even. He seems to be dedicated to his craft, not in a sadistic way, more in a loving a job well done kind of way. He's introduced when the provost assigns Pompey as his assistant, after Pompey has been arrested for being a pimp. Aborson and Pompey are in a really funny scene with another character called Barnadine. Barnadine is a prisoner who's been in prison for nine years, waiting to be executed for a crime that is never specified. He's presented as a walking catastrophe, a criminal with a horrible lifestyle. Uh, he's 
constantly drunk, he doesn't care about anything. He fully acknowledges that he's irredeemable even. When Angelo orders the provost to bring him Claudia's head and Vincentio has the idea to bring him someone else's head instead, Barnardine's head is his first choice because Barnardine is scheduled to be executed on the same day as Claudio. But the provost remarks that they don't look alike and Angelo wouldn't fall for it because he's seen both of them before. And even more importantly, Barnardine refuses to die. He's not at all like Claudio who's all stressed out and scared of death, no. Barnardine just can't be bothered. He just wants to go to sleep and be left alone. And since he refuses to be administered his last rites before death, he can't in good Christian conscience be executed. Because in the characters' minds, if you kill someone who hasn't had their last rites, they are going to hell and you can't just do that to someone. In the real world, I don't think that was much of a concern in Shakespeare's time or anywhere where, you know, the Christian religion coexists with the death penalty because it sounds like it would be a pretty glaring loophole in the justice system. But yeah, just suspend disbelief on that one. So instead of Barnardine's head, Vincentio and the provost end up using Ragozine's head. Ragozine is another prisoner. He's a pirate who died recently. I made a slight mistake in the vid on Measure for Measure. I said that the prisoner, so Ragozine, I didn't name him but that was him, had just been executed. Actually no, he recently died from a fever in his cell. But anyway, the result is the same, he's just beheaded post-mortem and it's his head that is brought to Angelo. And to get back to Barnardine for a sec there, Barnardine never ends up being executed. What happens to him is Vincentio tells the provost to put him in a secret cell like Claudio, while Angelo thinks that they're both getting executed that day. And at the end of the play, when the provost brings Claudio out of the prison so that everyone sees that he's not dead, he brings Barnardine too and Vincentio pardons him which is, I mean, cool, but to me, that's just another element that shows how whimsical Vincentio's justice is. He kind of just decides stuff at random, like, okay, Angelo, do better next time, all right? But you're fine. Aeschylus, mm, let's not talk about your role in all this. You were just doing your job with info you were given, and I kind of like you, so you get a pass. 
Lucio? God, I really fucking hate Lucio. Let's have him whipped and hanged. Hell yeah. Barnadine? He's committed some nondescript crime that he was condemned to die for nine years ago and that he has no remorse about. Let's just pardon him without looking into what he even did. I mean, I'm probably taking this too seriously. I don't know. And I'm not criticizing Shakespeare's writing here. These are not plot holes or inconsistencies. Not this time. I think the moral ambiguity of the ending is purposeful, probably. <laughs> not every story has to end all nice and tidy with everyone happy forever after. Maybe part of my uneasiness with the Duke's moral compass is simply due to the fact that society has changed since Shakespeare's time and what people held as good and evil is not necessarily the same as what we view as good and evil nowadays. <laughs> The way we think of justice has changed, dramatically. Like I said, the way Vincentio goes about assigning punishments and pardons seems pretty arbitrary by modern standards. So I'm not exactly sure how much of it is due to changing mentalities and how much of it was Shakespeare purposefully playing with moral ambiguity, but either way, Measure for Measure is a play that generates many conflicting feelings in you when you read it. There's some really dark humor in there, for instance, like you don't feel like you should really be laughing from a moral standpoint, but at the same time, the way it's presented, it's humorous. Like when Isabella first goes to Angelo to plead for Claudia's life. After Angelo first refuses to reconsider Claudia's sentence, she's like, okay then, the law is harsh, but it is just, God bless your honor, goodbye. I'm like, what? <laughs> There's actually comical potential in there, depending on how you play it, even with how dark it is. It's so interesting. Maybe the only character that seems to be straightforwardly good is Juliet, at least by modern standards, not at the time. But we also don't know much about her. You could still use her name in the Monty family as a reference to her, with Shakespeare's original spelling, for a distinction between her and Juliet Cap, which is spelled differently. I'm not sure why Maxis went with this spelling for Juliet Cap's name, because Shakespeare always uses the English spelling, both in Measure for Measure and Romeo and Juliet, but in The Sims, Juliet is spelled the French way. I have no idea if that's significant or not. Also, speaking of secondary female characters with a notable name, I demand justice for Overdone. <laughs> Overdone isn't even supposed to be a first name, and even as a last name, it's based on a stupid sexist joke, so call me an oversensitive SJW snowflake if you want, but in my head, I've given her the name Donna, which literally means lady in Italian, and damn it, she's worth it. By the way, you might have noticed that it's a bit weird that many of the characters in Measure for Measure have Italian names, but the play is set in Austria, which has nothing to do with Italy. In the play, there's even an instance of a character being called Signor, which would not have been the case in Austria, where German and German languages are spoken. Apparently, Shakespeare didn't really care about being culturally or geographically correct. It's the same kind of case as when he had characters travel from Verona to Milan by ship in two gents. The point is that the settings of his plays are foreign, as a vague concept just meaning outside of England, for the exotic of it. And I'm pretty sure it was also the equivalent of saying allegedly a lot nowadays. Shakespeare just didn't want to get in trouble with the English nobility if some duke thought that he was making a reference to actual events. Which Shakespeare did do, there are historical readings of his plays where you can connect some of the stuff he wrote to real people and real events that took place in England. Shakespeare could use a play to make a social or political commentary or criticism, he just had to not be too overt about it so he wouldn't be accused of slander. Anyway, if we get back to potential Veroneville baby names, that's pretty much it for Measure for Measure. There's a couple others, like Froth and Elbow, but to be honest they're kind of filler characters. Or maybe not filler, but they're not particularly developed characters, they're just there for comic relief. Elbow is a constable whose whole shtick is that he means something and says the opposite by accident, because he's just that bad at words. Uh, there's other characters like that in Shakespeare, in Much Ado About Nothing, for instance. And Froth is a man that Elbow accuses of having done something bad to Mrs. Elbow, Elbow's wife. Yeah, Froth and Elbow are last names, by the way, not first names. But we never actually get to know what it is that Froth did, because the whole scene is very confusing in a comical way. The characters just talk themselves into circles without ever getting to the point that they're here to make. 
just comic relief stuff. Now, if we go back to the two gentlemen of Verona, there's more secondary characters that I didn't mention in the two gents video. There aren't that many, just uh, a few servants and interestingly, a dog. The servant of Sylvia who brings her her portrait to give to Proteus is called Ursula. Ursula is also a gentlewoman at the service of Hero in Much Ado About Nothing. Panthino is Antonio's servant. We also barely see any of them. Then Speed is Valentine's servant. He gets much more stage time. He's a comic relief character like servants generally are when they're given a notable role. And then there's Lance or Lance. Both spellings are used apparently. Well, in British English, I guess both are pronounced Lance. He's produced a servant, also there to be funny, and he has a dog called Crab. They have scenes together, they've been companions since Crab was a puppy. Lance saved him from drowning and that's how they met. Crab is not particularly well behaved. He doesn't seem to be aggressive at all, but he's not very clean and you know, he's, he's not exactly welcome in a duke's castle, let's say. So if your Montes get a dog, you can stay in theme by naming it Crab. How cool is that? And if we go further back to Twelfth Night, um, I didn't mention Olivia's fool, whose name is Festa. He's your typical witty jester character. Olivia enjoys his company quite a bit. She's receptive to his wit. Then the rest are very secondary characters. There's two gentlemen who attend on Ducorsino. Their names are Valentine, which is actually already taken, but you know. <laughs> Shakespeare repeats himself with names quite a bit. And then there's Curio, that's a cool name. There's really nothing I can say about them, though they're not developed at all. And then there's the servant of Olivia's, whose name is Fabian, which is also a good name. And that's it. So here's a recap of all the names that I mentioned that I did not mention in the previous video so far. So that's it for this video, I just felt like I had to talk about these characters that I kind of rudely dismissed from my summaries, again to keep things as digestible as possible. And I know for myself that before starting the series I always felt bad not knowing what name to give to my Verneville newborns that would perpetuate the Shakespearean tradition. So if anyone out there has the same struggle, this video is for you. Before I go, I'd like to thank Simish again for shouting me out in a video about the story of the Caps and the Montes. She made a great video recapping the lore behind the two families. It's in French, so if you happen to understand French and you don't already know that video, I highly recommend you check it out, the link will be below. She has an ongoing series on Sims lore and it's all very good stuff. And welcome to my new French speaking viewers who have come from her video, bienvenue à tous. I hope you're enjoying the channel. And that's all I had to say, so have a good day and I'll talk to you later, bye! The person... A point. This name even sounds like abortion, like everything in it is just fucking terrible. But anyway, that, that's a name that exists. If you, if you have like a newborn that you really fucking hate, then <laughs> there you go.